Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. Welcome to the Myth Salon. Today, we are going to be gifted with the presence of Dr. Jeff Kripal. And I just couldn't be more excited to have Jeff with us as well as a panel that includes Chris Vogler, who many of you will remember a year ago, Chris was the first Zoom Myth Salon presenter that we had had. And since that time, we've done 25 Myth Salons. We've done numerous scholar talks with Dennis Slattery and Lionel Corbett. In many ways, it's been an exciting year. And in many ways, it's really been a tragic year. Um, it seems that we have leveled out on the coronavirus. It seems that we're going forward and we do have light at the end of the tunnel. Many of us are talking about how we've gotten our vaccinations and we're able to get around. But toward that end, I would like to open the Myth Salon with, um, with a, a moment of silence. And let's go forward and have ourselves a good evening tonight. It's hard to express the range of scholarship that Jeff is bringing to us. He has titles like Secret Body, Roads of Excess, Palace of Wisdom, Callie's Child, The Serpent's Gift, Book on Esalen, Comparing Religions, Authors of the Impossible. And this is only counts the books that he has the primary authorship of. If you go to where he collaborated, I mean, he has a whole library going. So I would like to open up with a poem on spring. I am the mother of all possibility, the moment where the bud, baby, dawn, and idea unite in a symphony of diversity, brought into harmony in the silent, sacred space between what is and might be, trust, and love grappling with death on offensive fear, a dance where life and adventure flower across a mandala of change and memory screams from the past the way a broken record parrots a metronome. I am the moment when from a sea of voices, a whisper wiggles through the maze offering courage, the bend in the light of day when the bud has just enough strength to reach the sunset for food to sustain flowering. When the shards of the coast's Pacific architecture finally submit to the embrace of the sea and plummet to the surf forever changing the face of the shore. I am the dream, the idea, the feeling unconnected, searching for a home in the adventurer's heart, mind, and soul, edge upon edge, window curtains shuffling night and day as light passes, pauses, and slides effortlessly out of existence. I do not know you, nor you me, yet we spin a cocoon of possibility into which we test how to transform the spark into fire. So my good friend, Will, here we are entering our fifth year of operation with the Myth Salon. And I couldn't be more honored to be part of the community that I believe serves the greater, the greater good, the greater people of Pacifica Graduate Institute and the people who study myth history, psychology, art. So take it away, my friend. Uh, it's absolutely, you know, I feel the same way. This is, uh, it's been such a privilege to do this for the last year and for the last five years. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, we used to meet in Dana's living room. Uh, and I, I want to point that out just because this is, uh, the, the people on the panel with us today, Jeff Kripal, just you know, off the charts, the heavyweights of heavyweights as far as the scholarship goes. 
but it's just great to be in a group with friendly people who want to just deeply personally for their own reasons engage this material uh it's just it's just you know uh best part of my month so thank you everybody that's here with us tonight and it's really cool uh you know i want to i want to also mention a couple things one is that uh, I want to thank Michael Weesey Productions for helping us promote this event. Um, they saw this as an event that would be very valuable to their community of screenwriters and filmmakers. And uh, I think many of you know that uh, an agenda of mine, an agenda of the Myth Salons and Myth House is generally to just build relations between the study of myth and the practice of storytelling. And just that means bringing the conversations together, bringing the topics together, bringing the people together. And so it's just really cool to, to flip it around. And Jeff was so wonderful to join us and support an event with Chris Vogler last fall. And it's just awesome to have Chris here uh, today with Jeff uh, flipping it around. And it's just an awesome example of, of modeling what that dialogue can be like and where it can go. So I hope that whether you're a mythologist, a psychologist, a screenwriter, filmmaker, that you get a lot out of this evening. Um, so thank you, thank you all. And thank you to Michael Weesey Productions. Um, so it's my privilege to introduce our panel. Uh, before I do, I just wanna say there are a couple things I'm especially excited for tonight. Uh, this is a really interesting time to be hearing from uh, Jeff. Uh, Jeff's been anticipating and discussing changes in our world for quite some time, long before all of a sudden everybody realized the change was upon us. And so it's just really, really cool to hear from you today in the context of, of this hopeful moment in which we want to believe and our fingers are crossed and we're knocking on wood that we're on our way out of this pandemic and into a new world, hopefully even into a new paradigm, maybe even a new reality. So that's really a treat for us. Uh, and then the other side of it is, it's just really especially cool to get to talk about that with a mixture of mythologists and storytellers. I originally got to hear from Jeff at the Pacifica Graduate Institute Colloquium and what stood out to me that evening was, or that afternoon, that uh, I think it was a 10 hour session, uh, maybe 14. And um, in that day, Jeff kept going through all these wild experiences that authors have been through, personal experiences that absolutely transformed who they were as storytellers. And I think that's something we often leave off the table. Uh, I think that might even be the type of uh, phrase Jeff might use, uh, too much stuff we leave off the table. Um, and it's just really, really important, I think, to I agree with him to bring that stuff back on the table, not just academically, uh, but also creatively. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll introduce our panel and we'll be off and running. Uh, and forgive me, as you've heard me say before, our panels are a really important, important part of who we are. So uh, forgive me for, for taking a moment and, and really doing honor to, to each, each of us here tonight. You all know Dana, uh, Dr. Dana White, who's a scholar, author, host of the Smith Salon and adjunct faculty member at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, my name is Will Lin. I lightly moderate these myth salons. My PhD is in myth, uh, and I've um, I founded a department called at Hushin College where we bring story into the general education department for filmmakers and storytellers. We're also joined tonight by Dennis Patrick Slattery, who's a mythology scholar, a poet, longtime professor in Pacifica's myth program, and an author of Obs of an obscure order: Reflections on Cultural Mythologies. Selena Matthews is a clinical psychologist, author, and keynote speaker who graduated from Pacifica and has been an ever-present participant and supporter of the Myth Salon. I think that she's been with us for all of them uh, in Dana's living room and online. Zaman Stanisai is a professor of mythology and political science at Pacifica and Cal State, a poet, linguist, mystic, and Fulbright scholar. Uh, Chris Vogler is author of The Writer's Journey, uh, who's with the 25th anniversary edition having just come out a former studio executive, story analyst, and teacher of writing workshops around the world. Dr. Patrick Mahaffey is with us tonight, which is really special. Uh, Patrick is the founding chair of the master's and PhD program in mythology at Pacifica, uh, mythology and depth psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute, and author of Integrative Spirituality, uh, which he joined us to discuss this past year. Uh, hopefully you'll check out his event. We'll share those links. And we're back with Chris Holmes, producer, DJ for Paul McCartney for the last 10 years, who studied mythology and religious belief. We were just talking about it before we got started with Jay-Z Smith uh, under the shadow of Eliada and Doniger, Winnie Doniger at the University of Chicago. And of course, we'll, maybe we'll get into that a little bit later, but that brings back memories for Jeff, who was actually there at the same time uh, as Chris. We're joined tonight also uh, by a recommendation from Jeff. Uh, Stephen Finley is a professor of philosophy and religion at LSU uh, and a uh, graduate of Rice University. His ongoing research gives focus to African-American Latter-day Saints, Malcolm X and gender, and African-American religions, esotericism, and UFOs. 
He earned his PhD in religious studies at, at Rice University working with Jeff. And it's an absolute privilege to have you here with us tonight. And the man of the hour, uh, finally, and of course, this is way too truncated, but Jeff, uh, Jeff Kreipal is the Associate Dean of Faculty and Graduate Programs in the University, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Jeff Kreipal is the Associate Dean of the Faculty and Graduate Programs in the School of the Humanities and the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University. Uh, he's Chair of the Board of Trustees at Esalen Institute and author of, I believe, nine to ten books, uh, including a textbook on mythology, a history of Esalen, an awesome book called Mutants and Mystics, and this most recent book, The Flip, uh, Epiphanies of Mind and the Future of Knowledge. And with that, I want to hand it over to you, Jeff. Really looking forward to a wonderful evening, and we'll, we'll dig in with you as soon as you're ready for us. All right, so I'll riff. I'll riff for maybe 30 minutes, um, 35, somewhere in there. I probably won't go 40. So yeah, I, I, I want to talk about the comparative study of religion, which might sound like a boring topic, but, but it's not. Um, it's about working with young people uh, in a college classroom and in a graduate classroom. And what I've learned over the years is really what teaching about religion is about is storytelling. And the question I always ask people to think about is, what is the story that you are living inside? What's the story you assume is not a story, right? They, because they don't, they don't call their religions myths, by the way. <laughs> people outside them call them, <laughs> call them myths. They, they, they see them as absolute truths that, that usually their parents or families have taught them not to question. And uh, they come to us at 18 or 19, and uh, they got a lot, of, a lot of hormones flowing through their bodies and a lot of questions bursting and they're wonderful to work with. And so the question is, what's your story? What story are you living inside? And is it working for you? And I think that's the kind of the key question because often of course the story isn't working so well. Uh, and so then the question becomes, well, how, how, do you, how do you get out of that story if it's not working so well for you, if it's tied up with your family and your beliefs and your culture and everything. I mean, that, that's not a small thing, by the way. That's a very scary thing. Um, and so what we do, I think, in the classroom when we do it well, is we help young people to negotiate their future lives vis-a-vis -vis their families and cultures and, and religious traditions, which is a really, it's a really delicate thing sometimes. Um, so that's, that's the study of religion in a nutshell, I think. Um, but behind that, what I've been harping on for almost 25 years now is that to me, the people who study religion are more interesting than the religions. Um, be, and it's because I've gotten to know them. And, They've told me stories and I know they're not who they think, I, mean, I know they're not who they say they are. I, I know that people who study and write about religion or mythology or what have you in the academy are generally leading secret lives. Uh, and there's a kind of, there's, a, there's another side to them. And I've really, I've really become very committed to this other side and very interested in it. Not everyone, I mean, so, some teachers are, you know, some people are just boring. Let's face it. There, there's, there's not an inside. There's not much depth there. But for certain kinds of people, particularly writers, by the way, it's writers really I want to talk about tonight. They have these really interesting lives. Their, their, their calling was often born in some kind of trauma or danger or death or illness or crisis. And they've spent really the rest of their lives essentially trying to write their way out of that, that initial crisis or that initial trauma or that initial question. Um, so for example, let me go back to the, the area I know best, which is the study of religion. So nobody grows up saying, I wanna be a professor of religion. No one, right? That would be one weird kid. You, you would not trust that kid. <laughs> that he would have, or she would have problems. What, what actually happens is people grow up and 
they're intensely earnest about their worldview and their beliefs, and they run into some problem or they run into some question. And they, they figure out that they actually cannot answer that question in the context of their given worldview. And so they, they look around and they figure out and they kind of back into the academy or they back into the professional study of religion because as I like to joke, it's the only place that will have them. It's the only place where you can actually ask those questions and get away with it. And, and I mean that. A lot of the students who come to me as graduate students come from other parts of the world and they have to worry about going home. And I really, I really wanna emphasize that studying religion, particularly as myth is not a neutral exercise. It's not a free pass, you pay for it. And sometimes your family pays for it. And so it comes with great cost to call into question the story in which one is born and through which one has meaning. Um, and so what I'm trying to get at is these, these writers that I'm, I most wanna talk about today, they don't just choose to be writers as, you know, I'm gonna be a fireman or I'm gonna be a policeman or I'm gonna be an NFL quarterback. They, they, they back into it and they're forced into it through crisis and trauma and questions and struggling with their own families and cultures and worldviews. And that to me is profound. And I think it's actually what drives culture forward. I think that's, if humanity progresses in any sense, and, and it may not, um, I think that's how it actually progresses is through throwing up these individuals in culture after culture, historical period after historical period that essentially say, well, wait a minute, that story doesn't make any sense or that doesn't work. What about, what? let's go this way, you know? And of course, they're not thinking those answers. They're res, the, their experiences, they're receiving them. They're coming out of, out of nowhere. They're coming from God to use religious language. But I think from a, a more writerly or creative language, they're coming from the unconscious. They're coming from somewhere offline that, that the ego doesn't have, have control over. So that, that's what I've been most interested in. Um, and I'll just, before, I wanna to get to Nietzsche here in a minute because he's sort of a perfect example of what I'm talking about. But I also wanna say, I'm not, I'm not talking in the abstract. I, I work with people and it's people that taught me these things, not by standing up and teaching me these things, but just by living their lives. And one of, one of the kinds of people that have taught me are my graduate students, including Stephen Finley, who happens to be here with us. Um, these are people who teach us. We don't, as teachers, we, don't, we know a lot about a very few things, but our graduate students know a lot about completely other things. And so when they come in and work with us, they teach us other things. When Stephen was with us, I was actually not working on UFOs, was I, Stephen? I don't, I don't think I had that, that embarrassing interest yet. But you did. You did. And you taught me about the mother wheel and the centrality of the UFO in the nation of Islam. And so that really, that was one of the things that I think led to my interest in, in the whole abduction UFO scene today, which I'll, I'll come back to. I wanna talk about that as a kind of myth making. Another student whose name I won't mention, Stephen knows him well, but taught me about Nietzsche. I had heard about Nietzsche my whole life. No, no, no person working in the academy, in the humanities anyway, has not heard of Nietzsche. He's one of those people with one name, Nietzsche. It's like Freud, Marx, Einstein, Nietzsche. And it's, he's a one name, guy um and we but you sort of absorb him you, you don't necessarily read him and i had never read him and one of my graduate students grew up in west texas in a fundamentalist family 
And by the time he was 16 or 15, however old he was, he was suicidal. He wanted literally to kill himself. He was so miserable because of this story he was living inside and was being essentially forced down his, his, his throat. And so one night, his mom and his dad left the house and his dad left the gun safe open and he decided he was going to blow his head off. Um, and so he got his dad's Colt pistol out and he went into a kind of mild trance state and he got in his car and he Ouija drove. This is his language. He Ouija drove to the Barnes and Noble in town, which he had never set foot in because as a, as a true Christian in this particular tradition, you could not enter such a worldly place as a Barnes and Noble bookstore. So he'd never been in there, but his car drove itself there. He got out of the car and he trance walked into the bookstore and he just kind of zipped through the bookstore. His body knew exactly where he was going. And he ended up in this aisle mark philosophy, word he had never heard of. He didn't even know what the word meant. And as he's standing there looking at this strange word, this book literally leaps off the shelf and lands at his feet. And he picks it up. And it's this book with the title, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So he says, well, he recognized two of the words, thus and spoke. It sounded biblical, right? Didn't know what Zarathustra meant. But he decided, you know, the book just just leapt out at me. I, I, I'm going to buy it and I'm going to take it home and I'm going to blow my head off. Right. So he buys this book, he takes it home and he starts to read this book and it starts to lightning and thunder and storm outside. And if you've read the opening of the spoke Zarathustra, you know that it's filled with lightning and thunder. Um, and he reads these pages and he just begins to weep. And he weeps, and he weeps, and he weeps. And these pages convince him not to kill himself. And he puts his dad's gun away, and he's a completely different person after that experience. So he's telling me this story. And, of course, I know him, you know, 10 years later. And, you know, guess what he's writing on, <laughs> you know. And... Um, I'm like, you know what? I better read this book. I better, I better read Nietzsche if I'm going to try to guide this dissertation. And so I did. And I was blown away again by another author. If you know anything about Nietzsche, you probably think he's this angry atheist who declared that God is dead. And he taught this teaching about the Ubermensch or the Superman that was picked up by the Nazis who did really awful things with it. That's probably what you've heard, okay? Well, that's not what I found. That's, that's not the Nietzsche that you find if you read the, if, particularly if you read the late books. And if you are educated like I think we all are in the sort of the modern university, you're also educated into this world that is really good at taking things apart. It's, it's, it's all about naysaying. It's not this, it's not that. We can reduce this to, to this particular social practice or this particular kind of authority or this kind of power. We can just take everything apart and we can show how it's all put together historically and socially and we're left with pretty much nothing. And so that's what you think Nietzsche, that's what you think he gave us. And, and that's all there. If you read Nietzsche, you can find that. But you also find all these extraordinary things in Nietzsche in which he was declaring his own divinity, essentially, his own ecstatic states. Uh, he was declaring, um, he basically was having precognitive experiences. He was writing about clairvoyance. He was identifying with this ancient Greek god named Dionysius. Um, he, was, he was going into these ecstatic states and then he would write one of these books in like four days. You know, and these books are still read today. These are still classic 
books in the history of philosophy that he just literally wrote in four days, you know, in some kind of ecstatic trance state, essentially. And I was just sort of blown away by this because what the humanities, as we call them, have become are essentially, you know, ways to take things apart. You know, that's what we do in an English department or a history department or a philosophy department. We teach students how to be critical, which is a good thing. And we te te teach them how, how to be suspicious of, of pretty much everything. But we don't teach them how to affirm anything. We don't teach them how to construct anything. It's very hard to say something positive these days and be a smart person. As, as I joke with my colleagues, uh, I say, well, why, why does the truth have to be depressing? Why, why does everything you say, why is it so depressing? Can't you say anything good or anything positive? And they laugh, but they laugh because it's true. And you actually, it's really hard to say something positive, you know, at least in that world. And this is why I think storytelling and screenwriting and movies are so important because they're essentially places in our culture where we can say something positive. You, you can actually construct something. You can actually imagine a human future. The other reason that Nietzsche is so important, and this, was, this will get a little more uh, uh, historical. For those of you who've heard me talk of Pacifica, you know I'm really, really interested in what I'm calling the superstory, which is this sort of emergent mythology that I think is coming through the floorboards of American popular culture. Um, and it has to do with engaging scientific ideas, but in occult or paranormal ways. So you, you, you pick up on scientific ideas like say electromagnetism or radiation or, or evolutionary change. And you read those things in an occult or paranormal or magical way. And, and I think it's through this kind of storytelling, but also through these kinds of experiences that a new kind of story is, is, is it's not coming together yet. It's all over the place. I'm not arguing for a single story. I think there's all kinds of stories happening, but they're all kind of orbiting. A lot of them are orbiting around these same sort of themes or, or, or myth themes. And reading Nietzsche, it, I realized that he was the originator in some ways of this super story. And there were, two, there were two things that he taught toward the end of his life. Both of them were based on a mystical experience he had in the summer of 1881 outside a little Swiss village called Sils Maria in front of a large alpine boulder. You can still go there. You can look at that very rock. There's a plaque on it telling you that this is where Nietzsche had his, his great revelation. So he has this mystical experience in this August of 1881, and he begins to teach two things. He begins to teach what he calls the eternal recurrence of the same, which I'll explain in a minute. Well, I won't explain, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, what it's about. Um, and he begins to teach the evolving Ubermensch, And he teaches these things as related. They're really twin teachings. They're really two sides of the same coin. Um, and the Ubermensch gets translated into American English as the Superman. The first person to translate it, the Superman was, was um, George Bernard Shaw in 1905. He, write, he writes a screenplay. Uh, um, called Man and Superman. And that sort of begins the, the American, or, or is at the beginning of the American reception of, of Nietzsche. Nietzsche's, Nietzsche dies in 1900, by the way. He falls into madness uh, in the January of, of uh, 1889. He's basically a vegetable for nine years and he passes away in 1900. 
and he's a complete failure, really, a kind of a flop as a writer during his life. But as he's deteriorating and dying that decade of the 1890s, his books are being read and start to filter into Europe, and they filter into the US. They eventually filter into the Soviet Union, filter into Japan, all the way over into Japan. And they start to have this sort of global effect. And this notion of the evolving Ubermensch, the evolving Superman, becomes the key concept or one of the key concepts around which he, he is received. Today, um, scholars are no longer translating Ubermensch as Superman, they're translating it in the plural as superhumans. So he's really teaching about an evolving super species that he called the super the superhumans, the Ubermensch, that would evolve out of the present day, what he called last man, which was essentially decadent, boring Europeans. Um, and he felt that humanity in Europe, at least in the 19, in the 19, 1800s had essentially run its course and that behind it was um, the ape or the, the primates and ahead of it was the coming superhumans and that we were evolving toward that and, or it would evolve out of us. And that these two species were sort of existing together, the, the sort of last boring humans, but also the, the glimmerings of these superhumans that you could detect in some individuals, but represented a future kind of super species. So you can see where this is going. <laughs> this is not, this should not strike you as a, as a foreign or as a strange story, but this all is in place in 1884, you know? And nobody knows about it, you know, because nobody's reading this, this crazy German seer. But it filters, it, again, it gradually filters in. And then you have this discussion of, of the evolving Superman that takes off all, really all around the world. You know, when I wrote the history of Esalen, this notion of an evolving super, superhumanity is sort of central to a lot of new age and a lot of countercultural spirituality. And I assumed that that originated with people like Teilhard de Chardin, the, the great Catholic uh, uh, Jesuit paleontologist, or Sri Aurobindo, the great Indian philosopher, spiritual teacher, who were in fact teaching a, a form of, of evolutionary spirituality. Aurobindo was teaching it in the 19 teens, by the way. Um, and he was reading Nietzsche. He, he didn't agree with Nietzsche, but he was reading Nietzsche. Um, and I don't know about Tehard, but I would be shocked if he wasn't aware of Nietzsche in the 40s and 50s when he was at his prime as well. So what, what interests me about Nietzsche is not only does, is he the origin, I think, of a lot of the ideas of these, these, these stories we're still telling, by the way. Those of you who have read my work know I'm obsessed with the X-Men mythology. Uh, Magneto is Nietzsche. If you want to know what Nietzsche said, just listen to Magneto. Who, whoever is writing the Magneto character is reading Nietzsche. I, I guarantee it. I absolutely, I will buy you a beer if you can show me otherwise. Um, did I say I will buy me a beer? Yeah, I will buy me a beer if you can show me otherwise. Um, so the whole X-Men mythology is about these two species. It's about the human species and this mutant species that are living side by side. And Magneto is arguing that the, the mutant should overcome or overtake or eliminate the human species, which is very Nietzschean language. And Xavier, Professor Xavier plays this kind of liberal humanist who is arguing for coexistence, right? So, these are two sides, I think, of the argument that's been going on for, for a long, a, a long, long time. The other um, central te teaching of Nietzsche, and then I'll, I'll talk about the superhumanities, and then I think I'll shut up, Will. I think I've, I've sort of run my time here. Um, is it the eternal recurrence of the, of the same. This is a very difficult <laughs> thing to wrap your head around. 
But essentially what it's about is that temporality is circular. It's not straight. It's not about cause and effect. It's about returning over and over and over to the same life and to the same details. And it's not that you live your life many times. It's that time is circular and it actually returns to the same point over and over again. We sort of live these loops, you know. Um, and he really believed this. This wasn't a metaphor for him. He, he described this as the most scientific of truths. He was, he was making a claim on the nature of reality. Um, and so this notion of time or temporality as circular, I think returns as well with all kinds of movies and all kinds of stories that we can think of as well. All right, the last thing I wanna say is, the reason I love this stuff is people who talk about the humanities will often point to Nietzsche as one of the origin points of the humanities, but they will never ever recognize these superhuman aspects of what Nietzsche was saying. And so the argument I wanna just put on the table, it's not an argument, it's just, it's just a proposal, is that what we think of as the humanities are also the superhumanities. They contain these individuals and these very, very special texts that are actually based on altered states. These are altered texts based on altered, altered states. And that we still read and we still teach these people, not because we're stuck, but because these are very special books that originated in very special states of consciousness. And people to this day still grok those states of consciousness. And they're still changed by them. And so I want to go back to my, my graduate student in West Texas. He grokked what thus spoke Zarathustra was saying. And it literally saved his life. The book literally jumped off the shelf. H how? I don't know. You know, but this is to me is a story about special texts, special authors, and how we interact with stories, how we interact with books, how we interact with movies in ways that are not quite simple or, or, or rational or, or even explainable. Um, so I'll stop there, Will, and then we can kind of go in any direction you want. Awesome, we've got some time tonight, so hopefully we'll get all over the place. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, for the for getting us started, um, and uh, since you've ended the last uh, circled back to that moment where the book jumped off the shelf, uh, I'll just take advantage of the opportunity to mention that our next event is on synchronicities. <laughs> uh, if anybody would like to join uh, two weeks from now with uh, Joe Cambray, but also you know riffing off of uh, superhumans, um, I've got to apologize for missing Voris <laughs> in the beginning. Um, I was doing a little bit of copy and pasting and I uh, missed uh, Voris's introduction. So I was, thought I'd ask Voris if he would get us, kick us off, uh, but before I do, let me give a quick introduction to him. Uh, he's a professor of rhetoric and philosophy and literature at UC Riverside, author of Keeping It Hush, The Barbershop and African American Hush Harbor Rhetoric, and his interests uh, are in issues of heretical energy, the dark feminine, gendered knowledge, racialized knowledge, and the demise of vulnerability. Uh, so Voris, I know uh, that it's a lot to try and respond to Jeff's ideas first, uh, so I'm going to throw it at you uh, and hope that's all right. Oh, it's more than all right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Hey. Thanks a lot for, I really appreciate your uh, kind of reclam uh, reclamation of uh, Nietzsche. Because like in the academy, you can't even think about postmodernism. Uh, your book, Flipping, made me think of... Uh, of uh, Stephen Greenblatt's uh, The Swerve, where he argues that um, how a particular poem rescued uh, modern philosophy. And your work, you know, given what I've read, seems to be trying to have us think differently about um, philosophy after this kind of postmodern move. So sticking with the Uberman, what I want to ask you is, when I think of, 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 of that notion, what I think is productive about it is how in, um, in A.K. Homo, he relates it to the, um, um, 
oh, the higher man or the higher person. Uh, and what he refers to as the, the slave or the herd mentality, uh, which reminded me a bit of Plato. So could you talk a little bit more about how the Uberman and its connection to uh, this notion of the um, 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 uh, or the higher man versus uh, like what he called the herd and slave mentality because in some ways it's very productive in terms of how he, and to me, this is how he, he, he gets linked to Jung with valuing going deep and in, in, in the valuing of not only going deep, but bringing that depth with you as you go into the world, which is very much what Jung argued in many ways too. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Jung, of course, really admired Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you've seen his seminar on Nietzsche. It's literally this thick. I mean, it's. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there are links there. So, so Nietzsche's most famous. He's probably the most famous critic of religion who ever lived. And he said some very harsh things about religion. Um, but what what often gets overlooked is that the reason God has to die is so that superhumans may live. Nietzsche believed that what we think of as morality, like humility and obedience and submission, are all the behaviors of slaves, essentially. And that Christianity is the religion of, of, of slaves. It's a kind of slave morality. And he wanted people to reject that. And he wanted the coming superhumans to create their own values, mm -hmm. right? So being Nietzschean, ironically, is not to follow Nietzsche. It's to, it's to own, own the fact that, that you're creating your own values, your own moralities, and your own worldview. And it's not relying on those submissive or... or those submissive virtues that have come to us through these, these, these past histories. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, and he says some pretty, I mean, you can, there's a lot of Nietzsche's, right? I mean, you can read a lot of things into Nietzsche, but what's, what's amazing about Nietzsche is how he was picked up by so many different kinds of people and communities in the 20th century and used in such powerful, powerful ways because of this idea that I was just sort of trying to articulate. Um, I, Stevens heard me give a talk. Huey Newton loved Nietzsche. I mean, Huey Newton was all over Nietzsche. And this notion of black power was Nietzschean through and through. Um, so it's, and there were, there, were, there were feminists, there were Catholic nuns reading Nietzsche. There were, I mean, there were, Margaret Sanger was reading Nietzsche, you know, the, 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 the sexual activist. There were all of these people who were reading Nietzsche not as descriptive. He wasn't affirming what he was analyzing. He was diagnosing it essentially in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I think, that's, I think that's what you're kind of getting at, Boris. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's right. But I think also too that, uh, He's dangerous to read because, in, on, on, for me anyway, because on one hand, um, I understand exactly what he means in, in terms of a kind of herd mentality that one wants to resist, right? Which gets in the way of people becoming super, uh, superhuman. Right. But on the other hand, he's dangerous for me because then he goes on and critiques certain social justice movements. Right. And he critiques. Uh, he even calls the socialists like uh, dotes, right? Socialist dotes and flatheads. Yeah. So that which I support, he'll say, well, that's maybe part of a herd mentality too. So that's what I like about him, that he <laughs> compels me to occupy contradiction. He, so, he, he hated democracy. As did Plato, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wanted to, to ask, because uh, you're talking about the book, Thus Break Zarathustra, which is obviously really connected to this uh, particular piece. And he talks about that allegory uh, where we go from being beast of burdens uh, to becoming uh, lions that confront that tyranny. And then finally, we become babies that, that can see the world anew. 
But what I've never had quite the depth or detail to quite square, and, I, and I'd like to ask if, if you'd be willing to help me with it, is how do you see the relationship between that allegory and the Ubermensch? Is the Ubermensch what happens when that baby grows up at the end of the allegory? <laughs> I don't, yeah, well, I don't know. Listen, Nietzsche, there's a whole industry of Nietzsche scholars arguing about things exactly like that. And they, they may not have anything to do with each other. The, one, the one's a parable that occurs early. The, the camel, lion, uh, child parable occurs very early and thus spoke Zarathustra. And, and the notion of the Ubermensch appears very early as well. And then it's just kind of dropped and comes back. It's not, it's not an extensive kind of thing. So, I mean, I don't know. The answer is, I don't know. Um, but, you know, you, you, the camel definitely is a, is a metaphor for the herd mentality. And the lion is the metaphor for denying or essentially eating the herd mentality, right? And, and, and the infant, as you said, is, is this sort of renewed worldview in which everything is new and fresh again. And that's what was so remarkable about reading him was realizing the naysaying was just, it, it was sort of warm up for him. It, it's not where he ended. He really, he really ended in these radical, radical yes sayings. Is it, you know, you talked about the, the way that our uh, academic culture is so high on the deconstructive thought, or at least spent many decades that way, especially in the kind of postmodern era that we may be finally waking up out of that hangover. But, uh, but, but do you think that, that uh, as we change what parts of Nietzsche we're gonna seek out will change? Do you think we might move on from loving the deconstructive Nietzsche uh, to being interested in his yes sayings? I hope so. Listen, I don't think we should worship Friedrich Nietzsche. Well, you know, we, should, we shouldn't get stuck in Nietzsche. I, I just, have been, I read Nietzsche because of my graduate student, you know, whose life he saved. And I was shocked by what I found. And I, so I think it's interesting to go back to origins because it helps us understand our present moment. But I don't think we should get stuck there and we shouldn't be looking back. Um, but he's a perfect example of a writer who's had, you know, it's, he's probably had more influence on the modern world than any modern philosopher ever. Uh, so he's important. You, have, you really have to struggle with him um, if you want to understand the modern world. Um, so it's that kind of thing. It's not, let's go be Nietzsche, you know, it's- Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually speaking of that, I, I thought I'd ask uh, Chris, some of this stuff is uh, Chris uh, Vogler. We've got a few Chris's, uh, but um, I wonder how some of this conversation relates to you to what we might describe as the ordinary world or that starting place for a hero. You know, how does this, this relate to how our stories are, are told now uh, from your point of view? Yeah, um, you know, it's always uh, a journey. That's the metaphor that I, I think uh, kind of holds my whole sphere of, of thinking together. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering from what I'm hearing here, um, are we evolving to this Ubermensch uh, or are we rediscovering things that we've forgotten? Uh, and maybe that ties those two big threads of Nietzsche together, uh, the evolving Ubermensch and the eternal recurrence of the same. Because I, I often have that feeling that um, I'm excavating stuff that uh, maybe I knew it once myself personally and forgot about it or uh, it wasn't uh, applied to the, uh, my life at that time. Uh, and then I'll come back around on one of my cycles and find myself uh, understanding something uh, in, a, in a different way. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, look at, at the journeys that way, that they're, um, they're, I draw them as a circle. That's the uh, diagram that I sort of adapted from Campbell, but it seems that um, that's limiting because it suggests that uh, you'll go around the circle once and you'll be done. And it doesn't seem to work that way. The circle has a loop in it and, and, and it, it, it continues making figure eights or some other kind of uh, geometric 
form and uh, you do find yourself reprising things uh, and uh, uh, making, uh, making the journey again, but with a different perspective every time. So I, I wonder about that. Uh, is, are, are, are we evolving or are we rediscovering? Forgotten knowledge, you know. I, I'm sure somebody on the panel is uh, up on that, on, on the uh, uh, rediscovery, refinding of these lost treasures. That's how I look at these things. When I stumble on something, uh, it's, it's always a delight because uh, I, I, like with Nietzsche or other people that I've read, uh, I'm certainly not up on him, but uh, other sources that I've read, uh, there's a delight in finding that somebody in the 1500s or the 1300s uh, was uh, right there confronting the same things we're looking at now. I mean, Nietzsche clearly thought we were, he, he was, it was future oriented, Chris, for Nietzsche. And he knew a lot about the past through his reading of anthropology. He was a classicist, by the way, by training. So he knew a ton about ancient Greece and Rome and, and the classic world. And all of your stuff on the hero's journey, you know, the hero, of course, is a Greek, is a Greek figure or a Greek character. Historically, the, the hero is the, essentially the hybrid between the, the god and the human. And so he was very familiar with that world and loved that world. But he, his, his, his vision of the coming Ubermensch was very future oriented. It did not exist in the past, it existed in the future. Um, so I think that, and that also I think is really prescient for our, our own worldview. I think modern spiritual seekers want to, use, want to dig into the past like you're talking about. They see all kinds of treasures there, but they don't want to be bound to that past. They want to move forward. The, the, the fuller truth resides in the future, not in the past. Um, and I think that's a decision we have to make as storytellers. You know, religious people, as I often say, and I know this isn't a criticism, but religious people locate the full truth in the past in some revelation. And so the, the, the meaning of life is believing or submitting oneself to that fuller truth that was already revealed in the past, where I think a lot of modern spiritualities essentially say, no, the truth has been revealed in bits and pieces, but it'll get revealed more and more as we move into the future. The future is more knowledgeable than the past. And I think that's a decision we just have to make, you know, whether we're doing history or whether we're doing storytelling. And it makes a big difference. Yeah, I was... Uh, uh amused by your story about the fellow from West Texas. Uh, I've known some people from West Texas and uh, that's a strange place on the planet Earth and uh, all sorts of things, including UFOs and uh, other kinds of uh, supernatural phenomena. Well, he was living, Chris, he was living in a world in which the, the complete and total truth was already revealed in the past. Right. And his job as a young man was to submit to that and believe it, no matter how nonsensical or implausible it sounded, his job as a good Christian of that particular tradition was to submit to that past truth. And what Nietzsche taught him was, don't. You, 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 either, you, either, you either submit and you die, or you don't and you live. That was essentially his choice. Yeah, there's there's a, a, a almost a stereotype here of the book falling off the shelf and hitting you in the head. Yeah. Uh, that's not the first time I've heard that. I think yeah. uh, Shirley MacLaine writes about that in in her book Out on a Limb, I think it's called. Uh, mm -hmm. That she was introduced to a trance channeler named Kevin Ryerson, who was a big influence on her, and that's how she uh, uh, came into that knowledge. It was she was just browsing and. The book fell out and conked her on the, on the noggin. So uh, it, it, it seems to be a pattern. So I'd like to hear uh, from some other panelists, whoever has got some thoughts. And, and I hope that uh, we'll come back to, pun accidental, this eternal return concept. Because we're talking about it from the point of view of Nietzsche. <clears throat> but the more we talk about it, the more Eliade starts, I think, wanting to come into the room. You know, this idea that, that maybe... Uh, uh, maybe this eternal return may also be mythic. 
uh, and maybe and maybe we personally live out our myths and ways that we repeat. But let's. I see Dennis is. Uh, graciously turned off his microphone and offered to uh, regale us with his thoughts. So Dennis, would you like to, to come in? <laughs> Thank you so much. And, you know, when I listen to people speak, I, I guess it's taken me a little longer than others, but I, I, just, I just watch or, or sense or feel in my body where energy starts to gather. And there are three places in which that happened to me uh, listening to you speak. And um, I don't even know if there's a question in there, but uh, the sign of a good speaker or a good writer for me is when that, when what is going on begins to um, gather energy. And that energy then takes me somewhere. And uh, right or wrong, um, I, I pay less and less attention to that. So the one thing that I got excited about is at the beginning when you were talking about the, the writing life, um, being born in some kind of trauma. And I, I in my own experiences, uh, that's right. About a week ago, I had a Zoom conversation with Edward Tick, who uh, through his soldiersheart.org uh, for decades uh, worked with uh, vets from Vietnam, Afghanistan, Ir Iran, and for years, decades actually, he took vets back to Vietnam. Um, and he's written a book about this in order for them to reclaim the soul that they left there 20 years, 25 years, and to reconcile with the Vietnamese people who were very excited and anxious to reconcile as well. Well, in the conversation, um, Ed and I both um, spoke to each other about the, the writing life uh, began in a traumatic life. And I think what you said is right, and I want to add a piece. I just wonder, because I've thought a lot about that conversation that he and I had, if the trauma, instead of writing one's way out of it, which I see absolutely as a possibility, that the, tr the energy of the trauma can actually shape the writing life. So I've, I've, I've shifted my um, perspective on early trauma because I think you're exactly right about it being the origin. But instead of writing my way out of it, I've, I've tried to befriend the, the trauma's energy, which I've carried for decades. And I think it's affected and uh, for the good, uh, my writing life. So that was one that uh, I found exciting. Uh, Chris, I'm glad to hear what you said about the circle, because um, I don't think that temporality is circular. I think it's spiralic. And I think we live and relive our lives on a spiral. And I got great joy in reading a number of years ago, I was reading Jung's uh, uh, dream uh, seminars, analysis of the dream seminars, 1928 to 1930. And on page 100, and I can see it in my mind, he writes, and he's riffing off of a dream that four, three analysts in here are working on. And he says, um, all of nature is spiralic. And then he pushes it another step and he says, all psychic development is spiralic. We are always coming back into our past, but we can never land at where we once were. We always fall a little bit above or a little bit below it so that the past is resonating but not repeating. And 
that helped me tremendously in feeling my way into the geometry of the psyche. And I think the geometry of stories themselves carry that spiralic. And I don't think it has to be one or the other, but I wanted to, I wanted to put out another geometry of the psyche and the geometry of stories, which leads me to the third thing. And I did have a book fall. It stuck to a book that I was pulling out in a bookstore in San Antonio way before I came to Pacifica. And it was the, the book that I was trying to pull off was a book on Ireland because my wife and I were planning during my first sabbatical to go to Ireland. And the book that stuck to that book and fell, and I can still feel right on my left foot where it landed, was a book entitled A Guide to Monasteries and Retreat Centers in the Southwestern United States. And I said, something is telling me, and I shared this with my wife, we put Ireland on hold because I think I need to take this journey, which I did and spent three and a half months journeying in Buddhist centers, uh, retreat centers, uh, Benedictine, Franciscan, and so forth. And, it, and then I wrote about it and it changed my life. So here's my point in bringing my story up. I wonder if some stories come along like that book came along for me and as like your student who had that book jump out of the shelf, I think some books have that much energy that they can lift themselves out and land on one's head or one's foot. That they, these cer certain stories come along when the culture needs them the most. And the writers, and here I'm gonna steal a term from Campbell, which I like. The writers become transport vehicles. And I would add even midwives to birth a story when it is most needed. And I also wanna suggest, and these are all suggestions, believe me, that stories have shelf lives, uh, narratives, have shelf lives. And the story, if it is not heated, its shelf life may expire and it dissolves. Now that didn't happen with Nietzsche as you've um, as you've beautifully pointed out. So yeah, th those are three areas that really kickstarted my reflecting on it. So I'm I'm very grateful to you for that. I just want to add add a little bit here because I just want to in, in, in kind of uh, talk about the circle and the spiral that was really interesting to me clinically. People in a pathology, um, whether it's uh, narcissistic personality disorder, when they when something a magical happens to them, and they are really within the personality, and they're so caught they can't move out. So if there's a sense of the circle there, but healthier people, I could absolutely see the spiral in, in you know, in clinic, clinically, it, it depends on the level of health where people can go. And because many people hate change, they are frightened of change. They're scared to take a risk and something that, that your, your client or, or your student did, he took an extraordinary risk. And that's as a clinician, what I hope all my clients do. Some can, but a lot can't, they get stuck in normalcy. And I just wanted to add that I, I see both the circle and the spiral. And I just wanted to add that. Oh, there's I think it's I think it's amazing that uh, the all the experiences that are being uh, connected uh, that might have been uh, someone who was really bad at shelving books that have led to these amazing inspirations and uh, and insights to life and tying these things together it just keeps coming back up where it's like uh, you know they, the significance uh, is uh, is beautiful there and uh, you know I think that we find it in everything that that we we look at. 
Uh, I, I wanted to say, Jeff, that I'm very sorry that I didn't know you when I was at University of Chicago because I did my honors paper with Jay-Z Smith on UFOs and how alien uh, varied over region and time. And I had a show on at WHBK at University of Chicago uh, interviewing everybody from Jacques Soleil to Bud Hopkins and Whitley Strieber and stuff. Uh, so it, it's a shame. And I'm really curious to hear Stephen's uh, thoughts on all of this stuff. <laughs> Well, well, that just seems to be sort of a natural transition since I had no idea what I was going to say when I unmuted, uh, but I did want to participate in the conversation. Let me just say a, a few things before I address that. I, um, Jeff Crapper was on my, my committee, and I'm not sure my PhD committee when I was at Rice. I finished in 2009, and I'm not sure if, if Jeff was working on the subject of UFOs then but he had to have done something because there was something about something that Jeff had, had written or had talked about that authorized, and that's, that's Jeff's word, that authorized me to talk seriously about this, this notion of UFOs in the Nation of Islam. Let me back up for a moment and say that with regard to my work in African-American religion, and the occult rethinking, totally trying to rethink uh, African-American religious history, which is dominated by black church studies and oddly enough, materialist notions about the world. And then teaching at a, a research university where I also uh, inherit a course called Religion and Parapsychology. I don't think my university knows what to do with me. Uh, I mean, I'm completely out of place in some ways. And so I'm grateful to have participated in the Esalen meetings since 2015, because in, in many ways, those folks have been the primary thinkers who I've been able to exchange ideas with to reformulate and rethink the, uh, my uh, primary interest in African-American religion. Because it's, it's, really, it's really odd that the folks uh, and the scholars in African-American religion haven't really been interested in notions of consciousness, the paranormal, and so on, which you might think is, is everywhere in African-American culture and religion. But in the academy, there hasn't been necessarily that openness to it. So, so I, I do think Jeff had, had something to do, in fact, I know he did, with the fact that there was this opening for me to take a new look at the Nation of Islam, which I would argue is probably the most misunderstood religion in the United States. There'd be more misunderstood than Mormons. Um, and so I wanna rethink the nation of Islam in, in light of UFOs and to use a term that they wouldn't use themselves. I wanna see the nation of Islam as a UFO religion. I, I also wanna see what they're, what they're talking about and in terms of their own story, which they understand as historic and scientific as a mythology. And that's the term that I use to describe it in mythology. Again, it's, it's my term, it's not theirs. They would object to it. For, for them, the way they talk about the origins of the universe and the cosmos, the origins of the races, the origins of black people is historic and scientific. It was science in the sense that it was the secret knowledge, the specialized knowledge that was passed from master to disciple vis-a-vis uh, -vis uh, Master Farad Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam in 1930, to Elijah Muhammad, who took over about uh, three years later. All of this becomes real and, and concrete in, in the Nation of Islam when in uh, 1985, Louis Farrakhan and some companions of his took a trip to, to Mexico. They, they take these spiritual treks to Mexico. And by the way, Sedona, Arizona, and some of this is gonna sound, these places are gonna sound familiar to you. And so Louis Farrakhan climbed the ruins of uh, Quetzalcoatl on uh, September 17th, 1985, where he claimed to have had this vision, I'll try to say this really quickly, of this, this wheel shaped vehicle that came over the mountain and summoned him into it. Now he says this was a vision, but he sometimes say it says a vision-like experience because he, he, he doesn't want you to think he was dreaming. This was very, very real. And so 
This experience of Louis Farrakhan in 1985 connected to a vision that he claims to have had, two visions really, in 1955, 30 years earlier, such that even the number 30 becomes significant, right? The number 30 is always showing up in Louis Farrakhan. He joined the nation the Nation of Islam in 1955, 30 years later, he's up in this UFO. So there's all this numerology uh, um, and all this stuff about UFOs, which, which I think functions in many ways to, to give the Nation of Islam and other black people a sense of transcendence in a world where black bodies have only been eminence. They have only been bodies to be co-modified and, and used. Uh, uh, for, you know, in various forms of production. And so, so looking out there in the cosmos for people like the Nation of Islam, for whom I argue UFOs are central and, and Sun Ra and others, um, you know, are, are, are really significant in the sense that they allow, and so this is where I think it might be a little different from uh, what Jeff is talking about with, with Nietzsche. For, for these, for, for these uh, black religious folks, I think in many ways, the effect has been that they become much more active in the world and maybe even activists, right? Uh, maybe like the Black Panthers. Um, it, it hasn't been just this con con contemplative exercise on, on consciousness and the universe being more than material. It's had a very real effect on, on how they see and live in the world and how they engage the world at, at at the intersection of these very important historical or so and social categories, race, gender, class, and so on. And so in that sense, it's a little different from, from what Jeff is talking about in his work on, on Nietzsche. And, uh, and we've been able to have these conversations at Esalen and through text and, and periodic Zooming. And, um, and I just wanna stop right there because I don't wanna get too far off the track, but I hope this adds something to the, to the conversation um, uh, that, that we can build on going forward. I mean, I think one of the things that have come out of the, my conversation with Stephen about black ufologies is very similar to what's come out with discussions with uh, indigenous peoples and their own ufologies. And that that is that the black communities and Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but tend to interact with these things in a much more positive way than white communities do. White communities tend to create what I would call an alien invasion myth. It's very much a Cold War narrative about the, the evil invader invading our Christian country. And it's all, a, it's something to be resisted. And so, you know, you literally punch out the alien or you battle it. You don't see that in the nation of Islam. You don't see that in the indigenous stories. You see the UFO becomes the ancestors, right? And they're there to protect and to guide the community. These are generalizations. I'm generalizing. But so, so I just want to say very quickly that, that Jeff is right. And in these, uh, these African-American UFO traditions, and I don't mean to reify them by using the term traditions, they're fluid, I'm still learning about them. They're completely positive experiences. There's, there's no sense of you know, the, the sexual surgery, um, the sense of abduction as a negative experience. In fact, the UFO twins who are two black women who live uh, in Arlington, Texas, they, they, they recommend not using the term abduction uh, when they talk about their UFO experiences, which by the way, uh, Erlene and Shirley, who are the UFO twins, say they experience these other, these alien others as beautiful black women, which is, which is again, one of the interesting thing about these, these black UFO traditions, the Nation of Islam, the United Nation of Islam, Sun Ra, the UFO twins, uh, uh, Yahweh, uh, not, not, uh, not Yahweh Ben Yahweh, but Yahweh, the UFO summoner. That's what he called himself. Um, there was a, uh, I just wanted to chime in. Betty and Barney, Barney Hill was African-American. He, 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 he was. was. The first abductee. He was, but I do see that as, as sort of a different tradition from, mm -hmm. from, from this one. Because this tradition, they almost universally see the, uh, their experiences as friendly 
and their encounters mm -hmm. in some ways as connection, like Jeff said, with ancestral spirits. It's, it's why they almost universally see aliens or these encounters with people who they understand as black. Even if yeah, they come it, from it, the cosmos. It reminds me of the, uh, the artist that did all the Funkadelic record covers and George Clinton record covers lived in Hyde Park. Well, and that's we exactly right. radio show, he would send me all those covers, but it was a, a mythology that was totally different from Heaven's Gate or from another group. And it was this sense of like, there's a superior culture out there that is filled with love that can illuminate us and bring us to a higher thing, which was totally different than the, the kind of Whitley Strieber, you know, being right. told by aliens thing. That's right. Uh, I'm and, definitely with you on that. And, and I do see it as a different tradition. And as you know, uh, you know, George Clinton and Bootsy Collins claim to have seen a UFO, right? And they and in talking about their experience with UFOs, which is which is where you know the album Mothership Connection come from, and all the and if you if you remember the performances of Parliament Funkadelic, they even had a UFO on stage, <laughs> right? And George Clinton would would float out of this this UFO on the album. Uh, and they, they even had a song called Unfunky UFO, uh, <laughs> for example. So really interesting stuff. But when, when George Clinton talks about it, they connect it to West African, ancient West African cultures like the Dogons. The of Dogon. Right. That's, ex that's exactly right. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different tradition that allows them to reconceptualize the cosmos uh, and, and their place in it in a world that they perceive uh, the, the meaning of black bodies or totally associated with slavery and white supremacy and inferiority and these kinds of notions. And Stephen, I, I'd be curious to know what your uh, Jeff Foss is, I feel like the right group to ask this question. Do you see, so, like, we were talking before about uh, um, uh, uh, herd mentality, herd cultures, thou shalt, and we talked about that part of the psyche that wants to stay in the conscious known space. And it's, it wants to maintain the power that it has over the conscious known world. It's not just the known world, it's also the part of the psyche that's that known conscious safe space. So I wonder if you think there might be a correlation between those of us that identify in that space, say, the, say those in power, that see that which threatens that space as that deserving of repression. Whereas those who are already repressed may not experience those disruptions, those disruptive elements that are asking for more as repression, but potentially as uh, some type of new new leadership. Does that resonate with, with any of you? I mean, one of the arguments that, 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 that goes on a lot in the literature around the paranormal is that it's an essentially destabilizing counter, counter force. And you, you see eruptions of paranormal activity in historical moments of radical change and where things are being challenged in a, in a really significant way. So for example, in the counterculture, the American counterculture was also very much an occult milieu, you know, where all of this stuff was just kind of coming out of the, out of the floorboards as it were. And when you, you get stasis or control, then these things tend to subside, you know? Um, so yeah, I, it rings true to me for sure. I think it's interesting, Jeff, with what you were talking about previously with the, the religions that kind of look to the past as being this perfection. We were talking about uh, Nietzsche and in a lot of the UFO situations, it's almost the opposite where people are expecting salvation to come from the stars and from the future. And you in that have this dichotomy of, uh, of you know, and then people go back to biblical stuff saying that all the, the Bible was UFOs. And um, but it, it's a fascinating thing when you think about it in terms of the the kind of heroic journey and, and where where the the growth is coming from whether it's uh coming from the stars or you're rebelling against something from the past um and i think i think chris the thing that people have the most trouble when, when i try to explain this is this emerging worldview is not scientific in you know, it's like take take a take a show like Ancient Aliens. Basically, what it does is it turns everything religious into something scientific. They're really just ancient astronauts. Mm -hmm. there, there were no gods. literalism all over again. Yeah, fighting literalism. <laughs> there, there no, were, and the skept UFO skeptics no are, are the most fundamentalist people ever because they think that things have to go in a really specific format. They can't deviate from that. Right, but then on the other side, Chris, you get. People want to leap into some religious format or some mythological, like 
Stephen's Nation of Islam believers, they will they will jump to a, essentially a mythology that that is affirming of their own worldview. And what I'm trying to say is this thing we're moving into is neither scientific nor religious. Neither one of those frameworks really work here. Mm-hmm. And the more you get into the UFO phenomena, the more you realize this. You know, I, I always joke, there are two things you have to understand to understand the UFO. One is radar. The other's revelation. (laughs) Totally. All these ecstatic experiences. uh, You know, we talked about it today with Nietzsche. We talked about it last week with Jung and Tolkien. Like people are experiencing these states of revelation. And there's a commonality to all of that. Like I wouldn't might even suggest that there's hypomanic nature to all their experiences. But in that state, they're connecting with this other. And it's, uh, yeah, it's really profound. I just wish I knew you when I was in uh, school because there, what, studying UFOs at the time wasn't done in the academy. And there was one professor that had done a dissertation in folklore on it at the time in Indiana. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Bullard. Eddie Bullard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I talked to him on my show. But like uh, at the time, you know, it was it was totally outside the realm of, of academic studies. And, you know, and it's, it's such it's, a fascinating and, and, uh, and fruitful uh, study <laughs> to teach us talking, about ourselves. You're talking to the two guys in the academy right now who do it. <laughs> well, it, it drove me crazy because we can learn so much about ourselves by looking at the other and our concepts of the other. And it's way more informative than looking at like, you know, matrimonial cults of Papua New Guinea. You know, as, you, as we talk about ecstatic states, uh, I'm aware that uh, we haven't yet heard from our mystic. Uh, Zaman, do you have uh, something to add for us? Well, I want to uh, take you back to uh, uh, the man who first said God is dead. And that was Prophet Muhammad. The motto of Islam was, there is no God, but there is God. So the first part is same as what Nietzsche said, that God is dead, the traditional God, the classical God, the God that was understood the tribal in, in whatever other definition, so that the second God is the paracosmic reality. That would be uh, for the Islamic culture, the, their equivalent would have been the age of the enlightenment in, in, in their terms, so that there's that parallel for which uh, the prophet went to uh, this cave in the mountain. Again, it wasn't to be understood worldly, but rather through a mystical experience. And that's where the first revelation happens and and the rest, of course, we know. But um, the way to understand that second God is that there there are two axes, the uh, uh, vertical and horizontal. In the vertical, you go from the outer God, the the God of the mythologies, to an inner God, that that there is a God within, within each one of us that we are in essence uh, God, uh, not in in terms of uh, claiming any sort of supremacy, but having the spirit within. And then um, you also go from uh, uh, to a a horizontal axis and there you're thinking about it both in terms of the genetic one as well as the mem. That from the genetic, you could look at human just as any other animal having consciousness and all that. But the meme would be that there is some kind of a, uh, what, what's the word, uh, transfusion, maybe osmosis is more uh, cultural osmosis, um, as some kind of a, an, an energy at, at the global level uh, to which we tap However, because of our ego self, the cultural images come and trump this and claim it in the name of one or another religion. But if we have the ability to prevent this quote unquote cultural takeover of the divine power realized within our souls, then then we are in in good hands. Uh, And I don't mean to say that in, in in the scriptural terms, but, but that, that we have reached that level of the, the super mensch in a way, that the God, the God is within, you don't have to go without. And so I just want to uh, uh, hear uh, Jeff's uh, reaction to looking at it through this consciousness uh, uh, concept, 
where we go from the outer to the inner, from the genetic to the mim, and to for each person uh, in that cross, there there would have to be some kind of a dot to locate where where we have received our realization, our uh, our awareness, our moment of the book falling on us, and things of that nature. And by the way, I did have my own experience of. Uh, uh, of the book too, but uh, we'll leave that for another time. So uh, you want me to respond to that? Well, you can comment on it, but... Uh... That's a tough one. I mean, you're really, you're really advancing a kind of mystical theology there. You sound like a Sufi, Zaman, is what you sound like. Part time. Yeah, and I say that with great admiration. Um, so there's Nietzsche, then there's, there's of course what we might say. I, I, I think I think you're 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 orbiting around a kind of notion that divinity is something that human beings share in, but of course none of us are divine in ourselves. It's not that Jeff or, or Zaman or Stephen is God, but that we're all parts or, or or sparks of this this divinity. And if that's what you're trying to get at, I mean, I certainly share that view. Um, my only concern with it would be, it also sounds like a good reason to privilege Islam. You know, and that's, that's where as a scholar of religion, I get nervous, you know, because I don't really want to privilege any particular religion, because then my scholarship ends up landing in a particular religious framework. So that's how I would struggle with what you just said. I think I, I think I probably agree with it theologically uh, and anthropologically, but I'm not sure I would say it, if that, if that helps. Uh, well, I think in a way your view is very Islamic, if we understand this. <laughs> and that Islam is not identified with a person, with a founder, with an individual. That's why it doesn't carry that name. Yeah. It's not Mohammedanism uh, per se. Or yeah. Per se, that's the the very reason that uh, that that this is being avoided is to call it uh, submission to a, a, a universal consciousness to the power of or yeah. to the energy of a universal consciousness. Uh, but of course, we human beings uh, have this tendency of of labeling things, and so yes, in today's uh, world, it has been labeled uh, as a kind of a, a, a tribal slash religious identity, which it wasn't meant to be. But um, well, that's who we are, of course. I like I like your I very much like you reminding us that Muhammad began his career by denying God, the gods. It does begin with the no, right? Right. Yeah. At the very yeah. yeah, and. I think this is what religious people often forget is they're religious the way they're religious because their founder or their, their early community rejected the, the religion of their ancestors. There's, there's something radical about the history of religions that we, we keep forgetting, uh, I think, just because of the shortness of our lives. So I, I really like that, Roman. Thank you. Thank you. I also, just to add a footnote, I don't think he just said no. I think the story is he went into, you know, the Kaaba and literally destroyed, physically destroyed the, uh, the, 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 the images or the idols. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that happened eventually, of course. But in the beginning, uh, he, was, he was not even getting close to the Kaaba. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if we can uh, say it with all respect, that he was a man of the cave, the message he had received in the cave, uh, to me, that was the real Kaaba in that darkness where he received the message. There, there was, I, I mean, it was so out of this world where the, when the message comes and, and, and the voice tells him in the dark, read, which implies that a message that makes no sense whatsoever to tell an illiterate human being in the dark cage to read because well, he can't read because he is illiterate. He can't read because no book jumps at him like it did to some of us. And in, in, in every way that is so out of this world. And, and perhaps that was one of the reasons that they said, well, uh, probably he needs to see a therapist or something is wrong with him. He was accused of 
a lot of things. So yeah, Selena, you would have had a good customer there. Uh, but, but the idea is that there was so much of a disconnect between uh, this man and the time in which he lived. Yeah. You know, the early, the early Christians were called atheists by the Romans um, because they denied the Roman gods. I mean, that's what it meant to be a Christian was you had to deny the existence of, of, of the gods of, of, the, of the Roman citizens. So, I mean, again, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just a series of denials going back. You're always denying the earlier deities of your ancestors. Well, I think we may be coming uh, near the end and uh, at least I think I'm maybe the last panelist to speak. So Jeff, I really appreciate your talk so much. And one of the ways I wanna show that is to appreciate your work a little more broadly and for the sake of the rather substantial audience that's been listening in. Uh, so your books have been mentioned in the introduction, but I wanna call out just one of them, the book Secret Body and recommend it you know, to people who are listening because among other things, first of all, it revisits a number of the books you wrote prior to that one. So it's a nice window, you know, into the other books uh, and where you connect the dots between those books. But secondly, and I think more importantly, and, and in some ways this resonates with Nietzsche who was wrote aphorisms, uh, that book, Secret Body has 20 marvelous aphorisms. Um, and, you know, the great 20th century cultural anthropologist Clifford Geertz once said, there are some ideas that are good to think with. Well, I, I have to say, <laughs> For myself, you know, those have been very useful for me to think with, and I'm going to, you know, maybe just mention three of them in particular that I think amplify what, you know, was implicit in what you shared with us today. Uh, and one of them is the importance of conjoining first person inquiry with third person inquiry. That, that's, I think, a significant way where we can and must really revivify the humanities. And an idea that you uh, expressed in still another book, uh, but which is very central to the Secret Body book, is the term hermeneutical mysticism. I love it because I realized that's what I've been involved was involved with for years, you know. And for those who are listening in, what does that mean? It, it's a way of, and here I'm glossing Jeff. He can clarify if I if he sees it differently. But as I understand them, it's a way in which when we read texts deeply, we actually can participate in the experiences these texts are describing. Uh, and I, I think that's a very real and undervalued or under cultivated mode of learning, you know, in the academy. And uh, so that's one of the three ideas I, I really wanted to call out. The second one, um, one of his and by the way, these aphorisms, he calls them gnomons, G-N-O-M-O-N-S, as in Gnostic sayings or Gnostic knowings, uh, is the idea of the human is two. And we have many, many versions of that, including Jung's personality number one and personality number two. I think we all have versions of it. And I'm seriously engaged in cultivating my own version of that. And I think one side of it would be not the historical cultural ego and its maturation is important and significant as it is. But the other side is, you know, to use a Zen metaphor, the original face before your parents were born. And, uh, you know, I think that's my way of kind of engaging, you know, one way of understanding the human is too. And I think that the humanities ought to cultivate that side. Not, not dropping you know, the critical awareness about ethnicity and gender and uh, colonialism and all the rest of it, but to you know, bring that into the mix you know, for a more balanced you know, um, approach to humanities. And thirdly, uh, your concept of the imaginal, which is so important you know, to Jungian and archetypal psychology, uh, I think is, uh, uh, conjoins rather nicely you know, with hermeneutical mysticism because it's a way to think about what kind of worldview do you then fashion when you engage these texts deeply enough and they become alive you know, and vivify your own consciousness. You don't really, it seems to me, end up appropriating a belief system that has been lived 
and and uh, celebrated and claimed, you know, by traditions in the past. But you basically, and here I say it in a positive way, appropriate or take in and and reanimate it in a way that I think maybe is best described as as imaginal, and it's another category, you know, other than scientific truth or or even myth in terms of the more pejorative ways in which you know myth can be understood certainly not the way we're understanding it you know in the in the salon so those are three ideas that i've really valued among many others in your work that i wanted to you know point to and largely for not just this panel but for the audience that are listening in because i think uh, it, it expands and amplifies what you so beautifully shared with us today so thank you patrick no, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure. There wasn't a question. Those were no, just- No, not only unless you cared to speak to any of those three ideas that I particularly value. Well, I mean, maybe just say something about Secret Body. I mean, the reason I call that the meta book. I mean, the reason I wrote Secret Body was I, I've done hundreds of these situations like this and people relate to me as if I wrote one book, which is always the book they read. And, I, you know, I've thought to myself, well, okay, I wrote that book, but that's actually not, that's really not, every, that's not what I think. That's just what I happen to be thinking at that time. But, and I realized, well, nobody's going to read all these books. Why should they? So I'm going to write one book that explains all the books and puts it all in 20, 20 sentences, really, is what you're talking about, Patrick. So that's what I did. I tried to crystallize everything down to 20 statements. And I don't know if that was successful or not. It sounds like it was successful for you, but it, it certainly was. And I wanted the audience to know about the meta book. So and the link is included. We just shared it in the chat. So if anybody wants to come back in one of these next sessions and let us know how well it worked for them, would love to hear. Yeah. You, you'll learn more about me than you want to know, probably, if you read that book. <laughs> Including my psychotherapeutic history, Selena, you'll 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 know more about my hangups than probably my family does. You know, while we mentioned secret body and and while uh, I've got you two interacting, I just want to you know take a moment to, to comment on the beauty of the. Uh, I read this great book on the Holy Grail uh, by uh, A. E. Waite, and his argument in the end is that there is no hidden Grail group that there's actually just a whole bunch of us with a secret inside of our hearts of wanting to do the right thing. And that that's the grail community. Just like, we just got to know it secretly that we're all out there doing it together. So I just want to comment that it's a real privilege to be in a conversation with a couple people, with several people in the grail community, uh, you two especially. So uh, thank you. And, and um, you know, it's just a privilege. And I see Chris has some thoughts for us and I was hoping he would before, before we closed out. Yeah, the, uh, the word that keeps uh, rattling around in my head is vibrations, because that's, you know, sort of my doorway into understanding all of this. And I, I'm just posing a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, is this um, movement towards uh, superhumanness uh, something that is simply happening, or should we get on board and accelerate it? And if that's the case, if we are, uh, if it's a good thing for us to accelerate this process, how do we do that? And the first thought is uh, in attempting to change the vibrational rate around yourself, you know, because we have to start there and, um, you know, try to improve and harmonize that vibrational rate. I, I have a lot of questions about this about um, is, is a, a better state a higher degree of vibration or a more harmonious degree of vibration. But uh, this, is, this is where I'm going is, is uh, how do we do that? And I've just encountered some studies uh, that the CIA did uh, looking into these matters and uh, they went at it quite directly and physically by actually uh, changing the vibrational rate of the brain, firstly through music. Uh, they, they tuned up the brains of the subjects who they were trying to train to do you know, spooky stuff of seeing things at a distance and figuring out what they, the bad guys were doing. Uh, and ultimately got into 
uh, manipulating the vibrational rate of the two hemispheres of the brain, sometimes shutting down one, the critical side, so that the creative side and the, the side that is open to all this could express itself. And then uh, they move to a phase of balancing the two hemispheres. And, and, and it, from that point of view, people were able to do some pretty impressive things that we would call supernatural or, or uh, hyperhuman. So uh, these are my questions. Should we be trying to accelerate, uh, step on the gas pedal about this? And if so, uh, how do we do that to change the vibrational rate in a healthy way? So I'll say a couple things, Chris. One is, you know, I think the, the stories we're telling in, in the academic culture, now I'm not speaking for the screenwriting community or, or, or filmmakers, but certainly the stories we're telling in the academy now about what a human being is are, are pretty flat. And, and they're, they're, they don't take in these, these extraordinary capacities that people talk about and report all the time. And that's what I mean by taking things off the table that Will was referring to, to earlier. We, we want to keep the human being small and we want to keep the human being flat and I personally think the human being wants to be big and wants to expand. And historically, we've done this through religion. We've, we've, we've essentially projected our, our, our bigness or our, our cosmic nature onto a being outside of us instead of recognizing that as part of us. And so I think today what you're seeing is you're seeing more people and more communities locating that bigness or that greatness inside humanity and not, not outside them. I think this is something Zaman was trying to get at as well. Um, so I think regardless of what we want to do, Chris, I think people will do that. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us who know something about these histories or know something about storytelling should help. I, I really think this should help. And Selena, to you, I probably get two or three emails a week from total strangers wanting to share with me some impossible crazy thing that happened to them. And the reason they write me is they think correctly that I'll actually listen to them and mm -hmm. I won't call them crazy or kooky for having this happen to them. Because I think human beings are like this. I think they're literally fantastic, but our public culture is trying to keep them small. So to your second point, Chris, on the vibrations, the thing that interests me most about this, these superhumanities I'm trying to get at, it's not just in the head. It's not just a matter of imagining things. Physical things are happening in the environment. Radar is picking up something. You know, people literally levitate. They, they, they literally rise off the ground, you know. People are healed of illnesses. We don't understand how. So there's this mental kind of subjective component and there's this physical external component and they're working together in really mysterious ways and that's actually what i mean by the imaginal i don't i don't quite mean it the way corban meant it but i mean it in this sort of double double way you're trying to get at and so i think that kind of vibration language is a perfect example of the super story i was trying to get at earlier that's a kind of scientific language that's also getting at something spiritual but also physical and real at the same time. It doesn't really fit in. Um, so I think we're just sort of intuiting our way toward that. Yeah, this, this just takes me back to uh, the development of science and, and to that period of time when um, it seemed that uh, alchemy and uh, astrology were working uh, just as well as chemistry and astronomy. And that um, some kind of choice or judgment was made uh, at top levels of thinking in Europe uh, that said, let's not take that uh, kooky path. Let's take the hard science path. And uh, a, a lot was lost, I think, in, in that there was a gulf at that point. Uh, and in, in some ways, I think we're back there in this spiral sense. So, so, so this philosopher named Phil Goff, he wrote this book called Galileo's Error. And basically, he answers what you just said. Basically, for Phil, what happened somewhere around early 1600s 
is that these early intellectuals decided, look, we can talk about the behavior of the material world, but we cannot say anything about the subjective uh, conscious awareness that is observing that world. So let's not do that. Let's remove subjectivity. Let's remove consciousness from our enterprise and let's focus only on the behavior of the material world. And that's what became science. And so science is really, really good at predicting and manipulating the behavior of the material world, but it's really, really bad at explaining you. You know, it cannot explain you because it took you out of the equation 420 years ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm remembering that I think the Jesuits uh, walked around this whole problem and were yeah. very inclined to continue developing uh, these things that they had seen as they encountered other cultures. They, they saw that uh, uh, things that were impossible by European standards were happening every day, uh, yeah. but they, they uh, made a, an institutional decision that th this is, it was like Freud and, and Jung uh, being worried about, oh, they're too kooky and they're too far out there, so we better not We'll talk about it among ourselves, but we're not going to make that the public face of our psychological movement. Jeff, I'm struck by how we seem to be gravitating towards power. My dog right now has the power. <laughs> and when, when I hear all of this, I'm thinking of what is the frequency for transformation? And I think that what we find is that when we involve ourselves with a, a, a group of like-minded people who are interested more in questions than they are in answers, the dialogue becomes fluid. And much like the Tao, it moves towards whatever is reality and its natural center without anybody seeking to impose that upon anybody or, or set up control of it. So I think that when you talk about these UFOs and aliens and what have you, those who are less interested in power as it has come to be defined for them are not interested in having the same kind of power. They, they see power as submission. And submission is if you give everything up, you have absolute power over everything. So I'm struck by when I hear Nietzsche and I hear the talk about all of this, about how people can find themselves in control, how they can wrest control from the uncontrollable, which is the Tao, which is everything. Well, I, I don't know how great it was. It, it seemed pretty incoherent listening to myself in my own head, but, but that's okay. I, I think I think the the way to sort of bring it together though and to respond to you is so what I I often tell people is I actually don't believe any of these things, um, but I also believe all of them. And what I mean by that is the reason I'm so fascinated by UFOs and aliens is that's what people experience, and that's what they tell me, and that's what they write about, and. And if they're experiencing a saint or the Virgin Mary, or I don't care what it is, I, I'm interested in all of it and it's all happening and they're experiencing all of it. It's all true in the sense that it happens. But that doesn't mean I believe any of it in an exclusive way that should apply to all human beings for all time. And that's where these they get upset with me because they want me to believe their belief essentially. And, and so, and the reason I'm so interested in paranormal phenomena isn't because, <laughs> it's not because I, I, I think all of this stuff is, it's not because I'm fascinated by one crazy story after another. It's that I think these events happen to mess up our categories and to shake us and to say, it's not like you think it is. And it doesn't tell us how, how it is. It just shakes things up and says, go figure it out. And so for me, these things are really, really important as sort of intellectual or spiritual goads or koans. These are like big, big koans happening all around us. 
And I just think it's a shame if we don't notice them and we don't really dwell with them. But that doesn't mean we should believe them. I don't, I don't think, I think belief is a mistake, frankly. In other words, we don't submit to them cognitively. We listen to them and we let them take apart whatever it is we're, we're assuming to be the case. Um, but that's, a, that's, that's hard. That, that's a hard spiritual practice. Um, that, that, and not everybody's capable of it. And I don't mean that in a snotty way. I, I work with students, I can tell you, not everybody is capable of that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you know, what, what just strikes me as we wrap up is that this tonight we've been talking with, you know, I, I see you as somebody that uh, has a clearer vision of where we are in our collective story than, than most, you know, and I think it's an absolutely special evening to get to talk with you in this moment as we're going through these changes in our world and we're trying to make sense of them. And you know, not to not to guruify you. Uh, I know that's not probably something you'd love, but to just appreciate and share my respect um, for your perception of where we are and what we're going through, and to be able to have that conversation with Chris and other storytellers here, who can talk about how we are telling that story today, and to have an audience and to have a panel that's committed to both making sense of our story today and telling the stories that will lead us into tomorrow. I don't know if the whole world knows what we're doing here, but I really, really love what we're doing together. And I'm so grateful for these evenings. And I'm so grateful that you've joined us. And Stephen, I hope that you'll come back and join us again as well. You're seeing plenty of calls for more panelists to spend some more time with us. So uh, thank you, Jeff. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. No, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. You know how to find me. And thank you, by the way, for not calling me crazy when I sent you one of those emails about crazy experiences that I've, I've had, because I've had a couple of my own. Yeah, but you're not. That's totally, that's the real thing. It's the real deal. Yeah, my, my publisher, Michael Weezy, calls it holding the space. That's what you're doing, Jeff, is, is you're just holding the space. And that isn't easy. And not everybody can do that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a valuable position because it allows for all this stuff to, uh, to interact without... Uh, judgment. Yeah, I think that's what Stephen called authorizing earlier. That's really what what I'm trying to do. Authorize people like Stephen to go out and say say things that he wouldn't otherwise <laughs> say. <laughs> I would also take exception to the idea of you characterizing it as incoherent, because the world is incoherent, and what do we do? We overlay coherence on it in the attempt to try to box it into something that makes it comprehensible for us. Yeah. And we know that that's a failed enterprise. Yeah. So I think you've been a source of enlightenment tonight. And I, I deeply appreciate what you, what you brought in here because I think everybody is going out into their lives with more questions than answers. So I'd like to thank everyone I'd like to especially thank the panelists, you, Jeff, Stephen, Saman, Dennis and Patrick, Boris, Selena. I'm sure I forgot somebody. Chris. Chris. I, hello, Chris. Yes, I'm sorry. He's the guy with the funky shirt. Yeah. And, you know, this bears for a repeat performance sometime. I'm sure we could come up with a very meaningful way to spread the benefit around. So saying less rather than more, um, let's go out with a moment of silence. So thank you everyone for coming this evening. So on behalf of the Myth Salon with my good friend and colleague, Will Lynn, until two weeks from now, we have Dr. Cho Joe Cambray, president of Pacifica is gonna come with us. What a great evening. Thank you all very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Jeff and panelists. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for your good vibrations. Ha, ha, ha.